we're still talking about stigmatized properties. Every year at Christmas time, I throw a big party for my agents and their spouses. One year, I rented a small rock cottage next to a very nice restaurant. My wife and I arrived first, and when we arrived inside there, it was already decorated for Christmas time, and on the tree were a bunch of little puffy angels. They were all spaced out very symmetrically, except two of them were right up against each other. My wife cannot stand anything that's not symmetrical, so she moved one of those angels around to the back of the tree so everything would be spaced evenly again. When the manager came over to see how we were doing, my wife told the manager what she had done, and the manager says, Oh, that's Mary. My wife goes, What? Mary. Mary never wanted to sell this cottage, and the day that she signed the deed was the day that she died. And now she just stays here, and she moves things around from time to time to let us know that she's still here. Well, how am I going to determine whether that's true or not? How, if I was selling that cottage, could I possibly be able to tell the buyer that Mary is really there or not? Who am I going to call? Some of you already said the right answer. Ghostbusters. Well, I don't know if it's true or not. There would be some people that would pay extra to buy a cottage that they thought was haunted, and other people, they would want to stay as far away from that as possible. What does state law say? State law is not clear about whether we disclose hauntings or not. How important is it? To some people, it's extremely important. And there's still that 15-minute rule. 15 minutes after the moving van leaves, the neighbors will be over there disclosing Mary if you don't. So you need to talk about the buyer if they're to the buyer about this in case they're concerned about it. You also need to think about talking to the seller because if you want to talk about a stigmatized property, the sellers may ask you not to do it. If they ask you not to do it and you think it's important enough that you should do, talk to your broker. Your broker may decide for you. He may decide to end the agency relationship with those sellers. In one area, there's a building that used to be a gambling casino. The rumor is that the county line runs right through the middle of the building. And that when one county sheriff would show off, they'd show up, they'd push all the tables over to the other side of the room. And when that county sheriff showed up, they'd push all the tables to the other side of the room. I'm wondering why these two guys couldn't coordinate their schedules and show up on the same day. If that building ever comes up available, there's lots of people lined up that want to buy it. They're going to use the casino having been there as a reason why they don't have to pay full price but it's going to wind up that they're still going to tell that story to whoever comes over to their property. Now let's talk about a sad thing. We shouldn't have to talk about it, but we do. Megan's Law. Megan was a little girl that in 1997 she was kidnapped. All kinds of unspeakable things were done to her and she eventually was killed so she couldn't be a witness or give testimony to what happened to her. This all happened in the New Jersey area. That was enough for a lot of people in America that they did not want to ever see this happen again if they could stop it. And so they got together and they came up with Megan's Law. Some of you are the, under the mistaken idea that if someone is a sex offender, that they need to have a sign in their front yard saying so. That's not quite accurate. There was a judge in Houston that was making sex offenders put those signs in their yard, but that was ultimately considered unconstitutional. He can't do that anymore. Megan's law does require that the local law enforcement people keep a database on where the sex offenders are. In Texas, that is done through the Department of Public Safety. If you look at the last page of the seller's disclosure notice, there is a piece of information about there to the buyer about this website, and you could go to the website and you could enter in your zip code and you could find out who the sex offenders are that live near you. Now the question comes up once in a while, do I have to tell the buyer about the sex offender that lives down the street? Actually, sellers and listing agents don't have to tell the buyers. Just between you and me, that might be the law, but that doesn't work for me. And the reason I say that is I could not possibly put a family in there that could be possibly in danger for what could happen to them. So I'm going to tell. I'm going to talk to the owner about it. And if the owner says, if you tell that, you'll never get it sold. 
then I'll give the owner back the listing and he can list it with some other broker instead. I feel like I have to do that disclosure whether I'm representing the seller or I'm representing the buyer. Now some enterprising agents have said, well just sell it to an older couple, you won't have to worry about it. Even an older couple have grandchildren that come over to visit from time to time, so bad things could still happen. Now they've done a little better job on that website, so go take a look at it if you haven't lately. They now have the sex offenders scheduled based upon their danger to the public. And some of them are in higher risk of re being re-offenders than others are. Some of you aren't even going to agree with some of the sex offenders that are on there. We had this discussion in one group I was in. Tears started flowing down in a lady's face. And I thought, oh my goodness, she's been a victim. When we took a break, she came to me and says, I got to tell you, while we're sitting here in this group, my son is downtown at the courthouse. He's being, uh, currently has a criminal trial going on. He's being accused of being a sex offender. He was 19 years old. He had sex with a 14 year old. She told him that he was, that she was 18 and now he may go to jail for three years. My initial reaction to that was, I think I can tell the difference between a 14-year-old and an 18-year-old. But since that experience, I have started looking a little more closely. It's not easy to tell as I thought it was. I ran into that same lady the next week and she admitted her son had been found guilty and he did go to jail for three years. Now hopefully he'll be out in 18 years for good behavior. His name will be on the sex offenders list for the rest of his life. Some of you are going to say, well, that's wrong. It was not where he's going to be a repeat offender. But it's still, he will have to register every time he moves. Now, you need to be careful with that list. It's not terribly accurate. When a sex offender moves into an area, he has 10 days to register his new address. In some communities, the sex offender moves in. He doesn't register at all because he says, they'll just treat me badly if I do. And then when the probation officer finds out, he puts them back in jail to finish their sentence. Well, that information may not be accurate either because the sex offender may have put in some inaccurate information. So be careful. In my particular case, I stopped at my mailboxes one day. Some neighbors were gathered around and they asked me about my listing that was at the end of the street. And I said, well, why are you so curious? Well, is it priced well? Is it going to sell? Sure it is. Why are you so curious? Well, because we built that elementary school within a mile of his house, he had to register with the school district as well. He is a sex offender. He likes little boys. That was the first I'd ever heard of it. I rushed up to the house. I got on the internet. I went to the DPS website and I looked him out. He didn't like little boys. He liked little girls. He'd molested an eight-year-old girl and he'd been given 10 years of probation. Oh, he ought to be glad I'm not on the jury because it wouldn't have just been probation if I had been in that situation. Now, everything we've been talking in this segment has been about psychological stigmas. It has not directly affected the property itself, but it also has affected the reputation of the property, and some people may not be interested in having the property because of that. Well, there's something else we need to talk about in terms of physical, psychological, and see what we can do about it. There are some people that are deathly afraid of getting the AIDS virus. And they do not understand the concept where it comes from, how they can get it, or anything else. And they would not knowingly buy a property in which the seller that lived there previously had AIDS. Now they cannot possibly get that disease by moving into that property. This is a psychological stigma they have and it has no basis on physical reality. You could say, well, if you're not interested in that property, I'll sell you a brand new home. What good is that going to do? How do you know the carpet layer didn't have AIDS when they built this home? So that's not going to protect them either. It would be better to educate them and let them know that that's not the way they can get AIDS. There's lots of different materials out there. You could give it to them. But my guess is you're not going to overcome this psychological stigma with just education. And you may lose that buyer where they'll just go say, well, I'm going to go find something else instead. AIDS is not a physical stigma, it's a psychological stigma, and it is something that you may want to address 
that you can't get it just simply by moving into that property. Well, what are some other physical stigmas that might take place? One of those would be lead-based paint. You see, they used to put lead pipes in houses, and they stopped doing that years ago. They went to copper. But then when they were putting copper pipes in houses, they were still soldering them together with lead, so there was still lead in the house. They used to put lead in the paint itself. And the reason they did that was the paint lasted so much longer when it had lead inside it. But they tell the story that when people get lead in their system, they could have learning disabilities or even stomach problems. They say that children used to go over and chew on window sills and they would get lead-based paint in their system and have those learning disabilities. I'm thinking if they're chewing on a window sill, they already have learning disabilities. Now, I talked to one fellow about this. He says, well, lead tastes sweet. That's why they do that. I've never licked a lead bar, so I couldn't tell you what tastes sweet and what doesn't. So I don't know for a fact, but remember the year 1978. If that house was built prior to 78, it probably has lead-based paint in it. You're going to do that disclosure. Let the buyers know. Give them that pamphlet that's red, white, and blue that's laying in your office somewhere to advise them about the possibilities of lead-based paint being there and the dangers that they may address. That pamphlet is also available in Spanish. I would pick up a few of those. Give that pamphlet not only to people buying a home built before 78, but also if they are renting a home built before 78. What if the house is like my house? It's been added on so many times. The older part probably has lead-based paint. The newer part probably doesn't. I'm still going to head and going to do that disclosure about the lead-based paint just so the buyers can decide do they really want that property or not. Now another thing that came up in Texas was the result of a property in Dripping Springs. Their water pipe broke and now there was so much water in the house that black mold started forming in there. They asked the insurance company to fix the problem and the insurance company repaired the water pipe but they would not remove the mold. The people felt like the mold was giving them respiratory problems and they sued the insurance company and the jury awarded them $34 million. Now in the appeal process that got whittled down to a lot smaller number than $34 million but it made buyers start thinking, I might be allergic to something I'm buying, I need to be more careful. If you have a buyer that expresses a fear of getting a house that has mold in it, don't say, oh, we don't have that problem. Simply tell them there's another test that the home inspector would be happy to perform at an extra cost, and he can let you know whether that kind of mold is there or not. Every house has mold in it, but it may not be the kind of mold that can cause the kind of problems we're talking about. The unscientific name is black mold. It has a scientific name, but I never can remember it exactly. So you'll have to look that up to see if there's a danger there. There are several pamphlets that are available about the dangers of mold, and you can pass that on to buyers if they express a fear in that. What's another physical stigma? How about asbestos? Some of the houses I've sold still have asbestos shingles on the outside of the house. It actually is safer to leave the shingles there than start breaking them off because that'll break loose the fibers and they will start floating around in the air. And somebody that gets that asbestos in their lungs could create a type of lung cancer called asbestosis. There are some commercial properties where asbestos has been sprayed on the ceiling as a fire retardant. And if you're going to do some remodeling in there, the city inspector may make you remove the asbestos before they'll let you finish out with the remodeling you have to do yourself. You're not going to remove the asbestos while everybody is at work. There's going to be some downtime, or this is going to be handled at night, or it's going to be handled over the weekend to make sure that nobody's in the building that's going to be inhaling those fibers that may fly through the area. Another physical stigma is going to be radon. Now I would venture to say we probably don't have as big a problem of that in Texas as other places. The state that I lived in that had more radon than anywhere else was Florida. There's an argument in Florida about whether it's uranium, radium, or phosphorus, but something in the ground is breaking down and causing a gas called radon. It comes up and stays in low-lying areas and because we build houses more tightly than we ever did before, the air exchange is not as much as it used to be. 
it winds up being a carcinogen that could cause cancer. 